my name is Pam Croper, and I am humbled and honored to be here today as April is Head and Neck Cancer Awareness Month. I was diagnosed with squamous cell carcinoma of the base of the tongue with bilateral cervical lymphadenopathy in October of 2019. Head and neck cancer um, ribbon is the colors of burgundy and ivory and or white. It is truly a blessing for me to use my restored voice to share my experience and some of the things that I've learned during this most unexpected journey and season in my life. I first learned that I had cancer was during a visit to my ENT and after an office exam, he looked at me and said, you have base tongue cancer. And then from there, a biopsy was done and it, con it uh, confirmed his um, findings. And then I was referred to oncologist and my journey began. No, actually there are very few symptoms. Um, it's pretty asymptomatic and pretty quiet. I was actually um, at a routine exam with my OBGYN and I had noticed a lump on each side of my neck but I really wasn't too concerned about it. But during that visit, I brought it to her attention. After she examined me, she referred me for a CAT scan. And the results of that CAT scan prompted her to refer me to my ENT, which is where the diagnosis of cancer was made. There are five major cancers of head and neck they are the oral cavity, the throat, the voice box, the paranasal sinuses and sinus cav and nasal cavity, and the um, salivary gland. Well, once you're diagnosed with cancer, there is a multi multidisciplinary team of doctors and medical staff that become a part of not only your team, your medical family, but your family as well. Um, there's my ENT. There I have a hematology oncologist, a radiation oncologist, and a surgeon. I have my OBGYN. She's really important because of the HPV diagnosis. It's important to keep abreast with your yearly exams to make sure that everything is okay. And I also have a dentist, an orthodontist. Your dentist is extremely important. Um, they do, in addition to routine oral care, which is extremely important for your journey before your treatment, during and after your treatment. Um, there's a lot of damage from the radiation that can occur in your mouth, um, including uh, jaw issues, teeth issues, um, your issues with your tongue and your gums, and um, to walk you through how to reacclimate back to even brush, something as simple as brushing your teeth. There are also uh, very important in, uh, oral cancer screenings. Now with the base of the tongue, your dentist is not able to go as far down as the base of the tongue. So it's important that our dentists become aware and if you've been diagnosed, let them know that they will also add additional um, a neck um, exam, um, which my dentist has done since I became diagnosed. In addition to them, I have a dietitian. Um, who I still walk my journey with. There's uh, prolonged issues with uh, swallowing and chewing and eating. The, um, you lose your taste as well as other issues. I've also 
um, lost my thyroid and my uvula due to the intensity of the radiation treatment. So in addition, a speech therapist was added to help me learn to use muscles that are still available and to strengthen ones that are weakened to help me to learn to swallow better. And in addition to those therapists, I also have occupational therapists and physical therapists who I see as needed. Um, I am at the point of my journey where I have follow-up appointments with my oncology team and my ENT every six months. That includes their routine exam, lab work, and a CT scan. It's very important that you keep those follow-up visits and to embrace all of the members of the team on your journey. It's so very important for your health. Although that sounds like an enormous <laughs> amount of doctor's appointments, and it is in the beginning, but they are so important to your journey in more ways than you can imagine. It's so important to your journey to be restored back to health and they become members of your family and they embrace you as part of theirs, which is so incredibly important for the healing process in addition to the incredible, incredible life-saving work that they do on a daily basis. So don't be afraid, don't give up hope, and they are even there to not just treat you medically, but they have inspired me and encouraged me and it filled me with more blessings than I ever thought a medical team could. So one day when we're able to part, I told them that I'm just gonna come once a year to say hello because they've become so dear to us but they feel the same way about their patients. So don't give up hope. Know that this season is temporary and you will get through it. It's not really that common. Research shows that there are, six, there are about 68,000 individual men and women who would be diagnosed with head and neck cancer in the United States this year. Of that, only 4% of head and neck cancer makes up all the cancer diagnosis in the, state of, in the United States. Um, of that, only 30% of those diagnosed with head and neck cancer are women. I think because um, it's predominantly a male cancer because the most common source of head and neck cancer is um, alcohol and tobacco use. And it seems to be more predominantly um, men who consume a little more alcohol and tobacco. And also in the tobacco category, it's not only smoking from cigarettes, cigars, um, pipes, it's also chewing tobacco. Women can also fall under the category of alcohol and tobacco, which is the most common. And the second is the human papillomavirus um, being the second cause of head and neck cancer. Well, HPV um, can manifest itself into other related cancers, but a base tongue cancer and cancer of the tonsils is one of the cancers related to the HPV virus. So it's very important when you visit your OBGYN, if they don't do a neck exam, request one from them because that is one of the ways that the um, neck cancer, head and neck cancer can be detected. In the past, um, I, my OBGYNs used to do a neck exam, um, checking the thyroid. And so I thought that it was always part of the exam, but not all doctors do that. I am hoping that more awareness 
of the human papilloma virus will prompt a new method of exam and put that part of the routine to examine a woman's neck. Well, if left unchecked, um, the growth of that cancer can uh, prompt the base tongue cancer and or cancer of the tonsils and the spread into the lymph nodes, which is what happened to me because it's so asymptomatic, so silent and so quiet. There are at this time no screenings um, for the HPV uh, virus that um, would bring awareness to cancer at the base of the tongue. I would say to anyone who was diagnosed with head and neck cancer related to HPV that I completely understand the reluctancy to speak up, up about it. Um, some of my closest family and friends advised me not to talk about it because of the stigma related to HPV as being the number one sexually transmitted disease. However, there's so much unknown about HPV. We really don't know all the reasons uh, and ways that people can get it. My family and um, some of my closest family and fr friends had advised me not to talk about um, the cause of my cancer as being HPV related because of the stigma related to HPV being the um, number one sexually transmitted disease. And that made an impact on me. It was not just cancer that I had to deal with on my journey. It was the stigma and embarrassment of the HPV. But as I prayed on it throughout my journey, I knew that I had to come out and talk about um, HPV. It doesn't matter who you are or what your past was or wasn't. HPV um, related cancers are serious and we should never be embarrassed about illness. It is important and it not only affects head and neck cancers, but other related cancers for men and women. And if we talk about it and have discussion, there will become more awareness and it will lessen that stigma and make it more acceptable to talk about without judgment. There is an HPV vaccine that is now available for our teens, um, both sons and daughters, both young teen males and females. And the vaccine is given, I believe it's about 13 years of age to prevent them from um, experiencing cancer diagnosis if they come in contact with the HPV virus. Now, HPV virus, most um, bodies take care of the virus themselves like any other virus, but there are a few people who contract the cancers related to that. Yes, uh, throughout my research, I have found that there is hope and new advancement in bringing head and neck cancer and cancers related to the HPV virus, um, oh, more awareness, um, earlier detection, um, trying to get more screenings through the Head and Neck Cancer Alliance. They are, um, in addition to the month, of April being Head and Neck Cancer Awareness Month, they are also joining forces with some doctors and dentists for free screenings. So this is really exciting and groundbreaking. So um, and in addition to that, the H, there's an HPV alliance that is bringing awareness to the HPV virus. And they're so um, exciting to bring more awareness. They're actually, there's actually a bill being presented to the Senate by them to um, get prompt more screenings and more knowledge and uh, research in this area. 
during part of my treatment, which was a combination of radiation and chemotherapy, there were many brutal side effects to these treatments. And it's, you often sustain in the mouth and throat area, third and fourth degree burns, something that's not visible to everybody, but it is definitely internal and you can feel that. During the course of that time, uh, it got so intense that I not only lost my voice, um, it was difficult to swallow and I had to be connected to a feeding tube for nourishment for about a year, which is about the length of time that I lost my voice. I would say, please don't give up hope that it's part of the journey and you will get through it. You're stronger than you could possibly know and walk in faith and take it one step at a time with your faith, united with your faith, your family, your friends, and your medical team, and they will all guide you. I didn't know about the Unite Sisterhood, but a dear friend of mine, actually somebody I was friends with since I was five years old, had been an alumni of Unite, and she prompted me to um, fill out an application for the Unite. Um, I didn't know it was something that I needed, and I did think that it was predominantly for women with breast cancer. But much to my surprise, UNITE is an organization that embraces women with all cancer. Part of the journey as a wife, a mother, a daughter, a sister, and a friend, we tend to hold our emotions in, at least I did during this part of my journey. They were so upset and I didn't want to upset them anymore that I guess I sort of just suppressed um, my emotions. I didn't want them to see me down or upset. Unite opened a door and gave me a gift that I didn't know I needed. It through programs like the SCART program and the Story Crafting program, it prompted me to look deep down into the emotional challenges that I went through during this journey. I thought, I'm a woman, woman of faith. All I need is my med medical team and my faith and my family, and we're gonna get through this. But I didn't really know that I needed a little extra support in that area. We Unite blessed me with the gift of healing emotionally. That is such a blessing. There are hardly words to describe what it was. And then there's the beauty of the sisterhood. And there's just an unspoken bond through unspoken words that when we get together, we just look into each other's eyes, a glance, we reach out, a sister takes your hand, and no words need to be sp need to be spoken. We just understand, and there's a beautiful gift and healing from all of that. I think the biggest thing that I want to share with everyone is to don't give up hope. Keep your follow-up appointments. And remember that cancer is so limited. It can't take your love. It can't take your joy, your hope, your courage. It can't take your memories, your family, your friends. It can't take your voice. And it can't take all of your blessings and so much more. So walk with joy and don't let it get you down and don't let it take anything else away from you. Remember all the things that you can do. When Annie was five weeks old, her pediatrician referred us to Children's Hospital um, for her diagnosis of bilateral congenital club foot. And we began her story and her journey. We became a part of Children's Hospital they embrace us as part of their family. 
Annie is a children's hospital miracle. When she was first diagnosed, her diagnosis was labeled extreme, which pretty much meant that they didn't know if she would ever walk. But through the incredible doctors, her orthopedic, the team in the brace room, the team in the casting room, all of the nurses and support staff throughout that hospital welcomed us. We began Annie's journey with a series of castings that took us to Children's Hospital three days a week for the first year of her life. Through the time frame of the first three years of her life, Annie had three Achilles lengthening surgeries. When she was four years old, she had a tendon transfer. And we continued our journey with Children's Hospital through a variety of treatments of castings, of braces, of Brown's bar, Dobbs bar, reverse lat shoes, and a series of other treatments, including Botox. We progress little by little with the love and support of Children's Hospital. And when Annie was three and a half years old, she took her first step. And we knew we were part of that miracle with our Children's Hospital family. We are forever grateful. We're still a part of it. She still has follow-ups with her doctor every year. She's um, doing well. She still wears DAFOs, which is the leg braces for her feet, to help. And we are continuing her treatment, her follow-up exams, and watching her journey. But tell them all the activities you do, Mala. Uh, I do dance and tennis, and I used to be on a jump rope team. I do all sorts of activities. I did gymnastics when I was little. We were. We were in the Battle of the Unite models together, the runway models together. And it was such a privilege to have my daughter there, not with me as mother and daughter, but it was such a joy and a blessing to watch my miracle walk a runway because of the gift Children's Hospital had given us that she walked a runway. She walked it <laughs> on her own two feet, a gift that we didn't think was possible when she was first born. It made me feel really special because uh, everyone just thought the worst and I proved them wrong. Yes, I am, and so is my daddy. It means a lot because we've both been through really rough periods in our lives and the fact that we can share the spotlight with each other knowing that we made it this far together and that we're going to make it all the way to the end is just really special because I can share it with my mommy. Uh, to not give up on their dreams and even though people say you can't, you won't be able to walk or you won't be able to do some, something you really want to do is just to never give up because you never know there may be someone out there who can help you achieve the dream and there's always a possibility that you can do it. Thank you LCMC and Children's Hospital for allowing our family to be a part of your family and for blessing us with a Children's Hospital miracle. Hallelujah, Annie. Thank you.